Well, hi, everyone. It is Mike Hinkson again, and you're listening to Unstoppable Mindset. Our guest today is Joe Xavier, and he actually has someone with him, Kim Rutledge, who we're going to draft to come on a podcast a little later. But Joe, um, for those of you who have not heard of Joe or met him, he is the director of the Department of Rehabilitation in California, which is really a fascinating job. Um, I've, I've never done it, but I know what is involved in it. And I hope that you all are becoming or will become as fascinated as I with what Joe's background is and what his job is all about. So we'll get to all that. But Joe, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Michael, good to be here. Hello to everybody who's listening in on the podcast and uh, looking forward to this afternoon's conversation. Well, we are as well. So tell me a little bit about you growing up and your your roots and all those things. Let's start with that. It's always good to start with that. Yeah, uh, always a nice start point. So I am an immigrant to this country. I came here as a seven-year-old child from the Azores Islands, and um, seven of us and my parents came here. I have a brother that was born here, (laughs) and at eight, I'm the only one with a disability, grew up in agriculture, milking cows, feeding calves, they were getting crops, and uh, went through integrated elementary, uh, high school, and uh, got connected with the Department of Rehabilitation, um, entered into the workforce uh, other than on the dairy farm through the Business Enterprises Program, did that for about 14 years Um, My wife convinced me to become a civil servant. And so for about 10 years, I did managerial positions within the department. And then since 2008, uh, been in various executive roles, most recently the director of the department now since 2014. Not exactly the path you might sketch out for a VR director, (laughs) but uh, it is how I got here. On the other hand, it gives you different kinds of experiences, which have to help you in terms of your your perspectives and all that. Were you blind from birth? I was. Um, very low vision. I have what is called uh, retinitis pigmentosis. Ah. And so my eyesight deteriorated from the use of very thick glasses to where today it's light perception and it better be extreme <laughs> Um, contrast for me to even know the lights are on. Yeah. Um, I had light perception, but have since lost it because being blind my entire life from now what they call retinopathio prematurity. I liked retrolentral fibroplasia. I've never understood why they changed the name, but <coughs> medical science does what they do. So it's okay. But I had light perception. And then along the way, just because the eyes don't function cataracts form. And so no one ever thought it was worth removing them just for light perception. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, it's part of who we are. It's part of, you know, our lived experiences to get to this point and, and see things the way we see them. Yeah. So you went off and, um, and did administrative work and then became a civil servant. Was that a significant switch for you in terms of mindset and just the way you did things? Or was it kind of, even though a a strange way to get to where you are today, was it sort of a natural life progression? You know, it's kind of interesting you ask that question, Michael, because when you first look at it and you think about it, you go, how do these things connect? But then when you actually put it together, it, it does really build on itself. So my first exposure at work was really, learning how to work um, and having the expectation and the experiences of working in various roles. I then went off and became a business owner. And being a small business owner is a really important piece of the work that I do as an administrator. You learn the whole spectrum of how things need to and must work together between policy and funding um, and the folks that you're serving and the folks that are delivering the services, whether they're your staff or or entities you're contracting with. But then I guess the other piece that really comes to play is that as I've stepped into the executive roles, you obviously um, have to really lean on your political acumen um, and your community engagement from so many different lands 
including um, any entity that has an interest in the work that we do, but uh, think of the business community that also has an interest in what we do. So in a roundabout way, um, these are all major elements that I've had to draw on and continue to draw on every single day. How political does it have to be, or does it end up being as you're, you're just dealing with being a small business owner or teaching people to be a small business owner. And as they go through the process, it's politics seems to be everywhere today. Yeah. I, I think, I think people hear politics and you can hear so many different things. Yeah. I'll never forget an experience that I had many years ago engaging with um, Grantland Johnson, who was the secretary of health and human services here in California. And I said, so you've had lots of experience dealing with politics, what's your best advice to me? He goes, well, the first thing you need to understand, Joe, is what politics is and what it's not. Politics is simply a conversation for the allocation of resources. And when you start with that understanding, it's much easier to navigate all of what you do. So that's a long-winded answer um, to say that in the conversation of politics, or better stated, allocation of resources. It lives at every level with every individual, every organization, um, every body. And so when you become comfortable recognizing that and then engaging in, it becomes a little more practical, a little more doable. So we deal with politics, we deal with the allocation of resources from the individual to the organization, um, and even on some level nationally and certainly at the state level. It's amazing how it's been warped. The concept of politics has has warped over the years, and and you know, leaving people like Will Rogers aside, who love to satirize politics, it's just really amazing to see how people's views have have changed and how people treat politics today. Because I like that definition. It's all about a conversation dealing with the allocation of resources. But we've just, as a society, seem to have warped the whole concept of politics so much. Yeah, I mean, I think clearly, you know, when you get talking about people's individual preferences and um, their own beliefs and values, that certainly comes to play um, in the work that I do. We focus on it uh, much more from what are the resources that are available and how do we best make use of those. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the world we live in today and you walk those lines and, and do that dance. It seems to me, if we were to really talk about what the problem with politics is, it's not really politics as much as it is. We've lost the art of conversation and we've lost the art of listening so much, which is unfortunate. Well, and then, and it's a good point, uh, when you, bring it down to the level of conversation, because I think that's what's an essential ingredient um, in the work that we do. Um, it's, it's being open to having the conversations. It's listening um, to um, the other people's points of views and interests and perspectives. Um, and at the end of the day, I find that uh, most everybody is aligned on a common interest, certainly within the work we do, which is essentially um, ensuring that individuals um, with disabilities get a job, keep a job and advance in employment. And then the other slice of work that we spend a lot of time on is community living, giving yeah. individuals the opportunity to live in their community of choice with purpose and dignity, um, regardless of how or, or where they are um, in their life's progression. Yeah. And it's fair to think about that for for all of us. And it is something that I would like to see more people do. And of course, what you do is you work with persons who have some sort of disability and you at, at the highest level get to represent their interests in the whole state process, don't you? Yes, that is true. When here at the Department of Rehabilitation, we serve everyone regardless of the disability they have or how they acquired or whether they were born with that disability. Obviously, you and I as two individuals who were blind, um, you know, obviously we, we come 
from that understanding of disability, but um, it could be a physical disability, it could be a cognitive disability, um, you know, it could be uh, sensory in terms of people who are deaf, hard of hearing as well. So we run the absolute gamut. And I think one thing that's really important for society as a whole to pay attention to is when we talk about disability, it's not just those of us who have it today. It's that um, infant that will be born today and unfortunately not have uh, the life of expectations that we want them to have. It's a person in service of country and um, service of community that will acquire that disability. It's the individual that because of an illness um, will acquire a disability, whether it's through a brain tumor or cancer and any other type of illnesses. And then you obviously have um, people that acquire disabilities, such as the person who is going home tonight that uh, will be involved in a severe vehicle accident and mm -hmm. tomorrow morning is a quadriplegic or a traumatic brain injury survivor. And for us, regardless of who those individuals are, uh, we want them to get the services they need to get into meaningful, competitive, integrated employment and just be your full selves. Um, realize that you have lots to contribute and the workplace needs that talent and society needs your contributions. Just out of curiosity, I know, um, and I don't recall exactly what year it happened, but at the federal level, they decided that for people who want the job of being homemakers, that would no longer be covered if I understood it right under rehabilitation services? Yeah, let me, I'll speak a little bit about that. So <clears throat> the Rehab Act is reauthorized um, every number of years. The most um, recent reauthorization was in 2014. Right. And so in effect, a competitive integrated employment becomes the only employment um, outcome that is now allowed under the Rehab Act. And as a result of that, a homemaker, which was otherwise an uncompensated employment outcome, the idea being that if I stayed home and was able to care for myself, uh, my wife or significant other would be able to go to work and, and you know, be employed. But that did change now for those that are eligible over the age of 55. There are still um, independent living services um, with categorical emphasis on blindness that enable individuals to get the services they need to remain at home. And if you are in pursuit of employment, then there was no impact to your services whatsoever because we will provide any service an individual needs to um, pursue and gain employment. Yeah. And um, it, again, it's, it wasn't anything that happened in California. It was a, a federal decision. How does it impact uh, you, not you specifically, but how does it impact the whole policy process to not um, have the homemaker process still covered like it used to be? What does it, what does it actually end up doing? Well, on the policy side, um, the impact is not what I would call necessarily um, onerous. In mm -hmm. effect, um, what it changed in terms of policy was, and we'll use you as an example, Michael, that if you had come to the department, you were pursuing an employment goal, you received assistive technology because of your blindness, we now close you as a, as a successful homemaker, you got to keep that equipment. Well, the policy change is that you no longer are able to keep that equipment because you were not successfully employed. So that means um, you no longer have the use of it. So from a policy side, that's probably the largest shift that uh, took place from a practical application. Um, had you been one of those individuals that were coming to us with the idea that you would refresh your assistive technology or get some upgraded independent living skills, you know, now those have to be done um, strictly focusing on employment. Um, mm -hmm. And if employment is not that outcome, then the ability to retain that equipment is not provided for. Understandable. Um, and, and at the same time, there are other ways to, to get equipment if you're not going to pursue um, employment under the definition, because what they're saying basically is, as I understand it, is that 
homemaking is not considered achieving employment. It has to be um, something outside the home that's a job, or let's not even say outside the home, but it has to be some sort of a a job other than being a homemaker. So you could start your own company as an entrepreneur and provide um, either jobs for you and other people that that are part of what a real independent company does. But as far as just providing the ability to to do things at home that we define as homemaking services are not really covered anymore. Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, what's not covered is the ability to retain, either get or retain those services if that's the ultimate goal. Um, but just to, just to put a little bit more of a final point, now employment is defined as competitive and integrated. Competitive meaning you're not earning a subminimum wage. Integrated meaning you're doing it in a setting where um, similarly situated individuals doing similar work are found. And okay. so those are the sort of three prongs of employment is that, that competitive and that immigrate, uh, integrated approach. So you you mentioned earlier, and, I, and of course, it's one of the, the things I think a lot of people, I see a lot of blind people thinking about it, um, the whole concept of starting a business. Um, one of the main ways that Departments of rehabilitation in general help people start businesses is through what we commonly know as the business enterprise program or vending programs, which come under the Randolph Shepard Act, primarily where people can be matched with places that need um, vendors to come in and provide services, whether it be a federal building where you run a cafeteria or vending stands and so on. Um that that of course is one way that people can certainly learn a lot about businesses and starting businesses and being real entrepreneurs. Yeah, it is. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. And I'll talk about self-employment. So we because we do have both. The business enterprises program. The short version is that it was established specifically for the blind and visually impaired. It is providing food services. Um, in federal, state, uh, local government, by and large, every once in a while we have settings in a non-governmental setting, but those are more rare. Um, and you are essentially either in a full food service where you're doing bacon and eggs and burgers and fries, or you are in a vending machine and then, of course, a number of settings in between. You go through, you get the training, you become licensed, you compete for um, locations that become available, you're selected, you operate those. It is a public-private partnership, public in the sense that um, it is public funds that establish that facility, that maintain um, and repair and replace the equipment of that facility and provide support services to the um, BEP, Business Enterprise Program vendor. Private in the sense that um, the vendor um, is a self-employed and whatever income they have is as a result of the earnings generated from the location once they meet their business obligations. The other one is self-employment. We do self-employment plans. Um, as long as someone can put together a viable business plan, we provide them with the training and the supports and getting them set up um, in those self-employment plans. And it really, um, depends on the individual and what they want to do. One thing that I always tell people about self-employment, you have to have a whole lot of self-motivation because nobody's telling you what to do and when to do or how to do it. And you need to do it in the way that ensures that customers not only only going to come to you the first time, but that they will keep coming back to you over and over again because that's how you're going to generate the sales. And without the sales, there's not going to be any income. And you have to be disciplined um, to, as you point out, to keep to keep customers and to keep moving on. It is um, it is very much a disciplined process, and and not even um, it's just self employment. But I know I've had a number of jobs over the years where I have not necessarily worked at the company headquarters. So 
1996, a company asked me to go to New York to open an office for them. And of course, that eventually led to another company that asked me to open an office for them, which took place on the 78th floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center. But in both cases, I was working for companies that were based elsewhere. So it wasn't quite self-employment, but it was certainly self-discipline and its self-motivation, as you said. Yeah, and and I think the self-discipline part, um, I'll never forget a little incident that happened to me when I was in the food service. Somebody approached me and wanted a $200 loan. And I pulled out my wallet and I said, I got 20 bucks, best I can do for you. And they said, well, no, you got a safe full of money. I said, well, that doesn't belong to me. That belongs to the business. Yeah. So when you are self-employed, that self-discipline um, really means you eat last. You pay all your bills before you know what you have available to you. That self-discipline is not only on the financial side, it's on you know the human capital, how you lead and manage your staff. And then, as you pointed out, um, are you getting up and figuring out what needs to be done and how it needs to be done and who's going to do it? Because there's nobody there saying, uh, hey, Michael, do this next or do that next. And there are rules that companies should live by, and there are laws that are the kinds of things that you have to comply with. And, and as you point out, uh, you had 20 bucks, but you didn't have 200 because, as you said, even though you may own the business and it may be a corporation, especially when it is, um, you're, it's not your money. Right. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so when you're working for other people, you got to keep that in mind. Well, and again, the working for other people is a is a an interesting term because you may be the boss of the company and it may only be a one or two person company, but you're still working for other people because you're working for all your customers mm -hmm. um, and the existence of the business overall. And you can't go fudging that at all. Yeah, well said. Which which makes perfect sense. Well, I'm curious. Uh, so you grew up as a blind person and went through all the processes of uh, going to school and going um, to college, right? Uh, yeah, I had a, a little bit of college, not a lot, but I had uh, a year or two of college. Okay. And then moving on, um, what kind of technology did you use growing up? What kinds of devices did, did you have? And um, of course, then the logical next question to that is how's that evolved over the years? Wow. Now, now we're both going to date ourselves. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not, no problem whatsoever. That's okay. When were you in high school? Uh, I finished high school in 78. Okay. So I finished um, 10 years before you, but that's okay. We still date ourselves. And well, who, who cares? Experience counts for something. Hey, I am happy to be here and talking about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, So exactly. Um, so <laughs> it, it's interesting you asked that question, Michael. Um, so I first started in school, the technology that I was handed was, um, magnifying glass, magnifying, not even glasses, but like uh, little bars that you could set on top of the piece of paper ah. and kind of bevel them would magnify the print a bit and then large print, whatever have you. But my first real piece, my two first real pieces of any kind of electronic technology um, outside of a tape recorder, if you consider that electronic. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> it's true. It was is. A, um, what they call a CCTV, a closed circuit TV. Mm. And I'm going to tell you, you needed a whole lot of space and you needed a pretty sturdy desk to put yeah. that stuff up on. it. Um, and then I had a talking calculator. My first talking calculator cost me 400 bucks. Was that the TSI Speech Plus? It was. It was. <laughs> I had now, one of those. Yeah. Now today I'm sitting here, uh, iPhone and my uh, on a clip on my belt with a Bluetooth keyboard out of the box doing amazing things, note taking, emailing, texting, phone calls, apps to do a myriad of different things, just a, an access and power I never thought I would have at my fingertips. In front of me is a computer with JAWS that enables me to read, write, um, and do all of those functions that I need to do for, you know, my everyday job and, and as well as is at home. So 
what's really cool about all this is slow, no doubt, but nonetheless impactful is how much of this is being built in from the ground up. We are far from perfection, but it is noteworthy that we are continuing to make progress, that the assistive part of technology is being built, built in, which means you and I as a user don't have to go and pay out-of-pocket money over and above to get um, a piece of technology that works for us. And then there's many other things like the Echo devices and the Google devices in your homes and the access that those can provide. Um, but you know, there's a generational piece to this. Mm -hmm. um, you and I started talking about our ages. What I find is that my five-year-old grandson gravitates to this stuff and it's intuitive. And my 91-year-old mother looks at an iPad and sees a piece of glass and struggles to figure out what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So just like in the other era in time, I think um, as generations um, move on and as technology evolves, I think we're in a better place all the time. We're definitely in a better place. It's 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 funny what, what immediately comes to mind when you make that comparison is, of course, the old joke. And nowadays, I'm not sure how many people really get it, but how adults really had a hard time manipulating VCRs and they always had to have their kids or their grandkids work the VCRs because they couldn't. Yeah. Well said. And yeah. it's not that they were all that complicated. It's just that it is not what people are used to. And we, I don't know, I don't know why that is, whether we just don't do enough to teach people to be more curious or more explorative or what, but it is unfortunate that we have so many people that have such a hard time migrating as the technological world changes. You know, um, I, Mark, Michael, you bring up a really interesting thought. And it, it's interesting that you bring this up right now because I literally have just had this conversation uh, a couple hours ago with a colleague. I think um, we sometimes stay very comfortable with what we have and it works which means we don't take the opportunity to learn something new. And I think the challenge with that is that it, at some point you wake up and you go, oh my God, this stuff is also changed. I don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So big word of encouragement to everybody. Yes, it's, it's stressful. It's challenging to learn and keep learning and keep learning. But I think you're better off to keep learning a little bit every day than you are to wait 10, 20, 30 years and then all of a sudden figure out you got to learn how to use something you don't have any concept of how to. And that has nothing to do with blindness, eyesight, ability, or person who happens to have a disability. That's societal. And I absolutely agree with you. And it, it also needs, I think, to be said that what we need to recognize is that technology is a tool or set of tools that we can use, but we still are the ones at least the theory is, we are still the ones that need to manipulate the tools or utilize the technology rather than being afraid of it. And I think that fear is one of the big things that we face. Well, I think that, I think that fear is one piece of it. I mean, I think the other piece that I would add to you, and, and I, I do this quite often with my team. Um, yes, I do have a pencil box. Uh, true, I haven't sharpened the pencils in I don't know how many years. <laughs> But I will reach in the pencil box and grab out a pencil and say, look, the fact that I have this doesn't make me Shakespeare, right? And I think right. too many times we conflate the two. Having a pencil makes it a whole lot easier for me to write and, and maybe some corrections or what have you. But it does nothing in terms of what I write, how I write it, um, and what I'm trying to convey or say. And... I think that's true of all pieces of technology, whether it's an iPhone or JAWS on a computer or you name it, right? The competence of knowing how to use the technology is essential. But that competence does not mean you're going to be good at your job or I'm going to be good at my job. The writing helps with the concept of knowing 
a little bit better how to communicate, but it still requires us to do it and to learn it and then to learn the other kinds of things that we need. You're right. Um, I carry with me everywhere I go when I travel, especially uh, pens, ballpoint pens and markers. And sometimes mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to which one I grab, um, but that's okay for, for sighted people. They can they can tell me why they would prefer I use a marker in a particular place. And I'm willing to accommodate those less fortunate than I who <laughs> happen to use eyesight. <laughs> but still, um, I wouldn't be caught without having uh, some sort of way of writing in the traditional eyesighted sort of way. And, and in my backpack, I have pens as well. Um, I remember once Hallmark sold wooden pens. So they had these, these pens uh -huh. and, and the outside was rosewood. And somebody said to me, it's always the blind guys who have the fanciest pens. And I said, well, you know, we want to impress you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, makes, but it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people have all kinds of impressions, don't they? Don't they, though? Uh, on the other hand, um, I was able to pull the pen out or or pencil and the hallmark thing came with a pen and a lead pencil and so i carried them both and and used them and it makes perfect sense and i wouldn't be caught without them just like one of the the things that i was very fortunate to learn it was braille yeah and i see us unfortunately moving away from that and a lot of what I see is the educational system that says, oh, you don't need Braille anymore because you can listen to books and you can listen to them on your computer or you can get them recorded and so on. That works really well until you need to learn how to pass, how to spell on a spelling test or when you need to be able to compose a document. Um, and if you don't really learn how, or if you want to deal with mathematical equations and so on, you've got to be able to um, peruse a page, peruse and, and move around. And you can't do that as easily and as effectively without Braille if you happen to be blind. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, Michael, um, I admire and I have a, know a number of people that are what I would call true Braille readers. And the way I can always tell if somebody is a real um, Braille user is their ability to stand in front of a crowd and deliver a speech. Uh, I, on the other hand, do not make speeches. I will talk to people. Um, and then part is I am not a Braille user that has that level of skill. I use Braille in a very elementary way, a rudimentary way. Um, but I admire those individuals um, that either grew up using it from birth and had very little other choices and, and continue to be avid users of it. Um, you know, yes, I think for all the reasons you've said, knowing Braille is invaluable. Certainly, we, you know, will always support the individuals that want to do that. And yet, at the same time, you know, the advent of um, speech, um, like what we have with JAWS, has also made it much more um, interfacing and much mm -hmm. more usable with so many other um, pieces of technology that we otherwise might not have access to. So I will often say to folks, don't think of it as one uh, or either or, it's and. Right? Yeah. It's and. How do you do both? How do you become adept at Braille and how do you leverage the other technology that is here? I choose not to use a Braille display on a daily basis to interact with my computer mm -hmm. because JAWS is faster right. until I get to some things that require me to do more to understand formatting. And yes, I could work through some of that with JAWS yep. or other screen reading technologies, but Braille does make it more effective. Of course, we still don't have multi-line Braille displays, although we're working toward that. But still, Braille gives me information that I wouldn't get just from speech. And I suppose you could say for the person who likes to read and sit somewhere and quietly read, 
Braille also adds some value, just like reading print quietly somewhere adds value because you get to just really let your mind go and deal with the book. And when you're listening to someone, you're focusing on the reading as much as you are the book. So you can't really let your mind drift and get into the book like you can with Braille or print. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's right. And I also think that it, it, it's also interesting to take note of the fact that, that the idea of logging around the big Braille book is like lo- logging around um, the big uh, textbook has yeah. gone a little bit by it's the way. Gone. This technology makes it so much more usable, right? You can get sure. a, a Braille display and, and you know access your electronics in that way. So, um, you know, it's both. Right, it's it's knowing how to use it, and then you have the different options, whether it's the the, the actual paper or braille displays or what what have you. So, yeah, um, and it, it is it is unfortunate that we're not necessarily catching on to that. But I really like what you said, which is it isn't one or the other; it is both, and it's nice to have a choice. And the most important thing I think that any of us can really learn to do is to understand the value of each of the tools so that we make the the best choice with what we have. But if we don't really know all the tools, then that's what makes it more difficult to really make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So it makes perfect sense to take advantage of those choices and then operate accordingly. And, and it's, and it's a lot of fun. I remember when the original Kurzweil reading machine was developed and it had the advantage that we knew there were so many books that were not available. And so giving someone the ability to suddenly have limited access back in the 1970s, but still access to a lot more printed material was reasonably well accepted, which, which was cool. Um, And it evolved over the years. So using your analogy, now I can just grab an iPhone or an Android phone and run one of many different kinds of apps. Some are better than others, but I can read a whole heck of a lot more than I ever could with the original machine. And being involved with the original machine, I remember how limited it was in some senses. So Uh much better today. Uh Yeah. Yeah, no, it, 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 technology has come such a, such a long way. Um, You know, and and it's funny, you were talking about the iPhone. I have one as well. Um, Now they have these like miniature Braille displays that you can just, use as a Bluetooth with your iPhone. Who would have ever thought that was going to be possible? Yeah. Um, and, and, and it just, you know, the way I always look at it is, how do I gain access to information I otherwise don't have available to me? Right? There's a, I mean, absolutely. There's a company called Independent Science that has made scientific equipment accessible by taking some commercially available products and making them talk, but also the ability to, um, sonify graphs and so on. And now independent science is beginning to work on a tactile graphics display so that people can actually work in the laboratory and in real time, not only get a graph of what is occurring, just like a, a sighted person would be able mm-hmm. to do, but they're also able to see it change. So it isn't like it's a static graph. You can actually, uh, like if you, uh, as, as the, creators of it have have done you can feel a ball rolling around on, yeah. on the screen yeah. and that's really cool that that kind of stuff is happening and and yeah. so we're going to see and and you know the reality is i think it's not something that just blind people will be able to use and i think that's an important point about a lot of the technology it isn't just something that a blind person can use look at voiceover now, i'm, I'm exactly. still surprised we're not using it as much as we should well but you know <clears throat> It's interesting you bring that up because what we're learning, I think, around all of the, let's let's call it accommodations. These are actually what I'm going to term more of a universal design. Yeah. And that when you think of a universal, universal mindset, you start to create things that people don't think they need, but they end up using. 
and not just people with disabilities. Let me give you a really quick example. Um, my daughter has an iPhone, lost all the sound on her iPhone, could, could make calls, could answer the phone, but she didn't know that it was ringing, couldn't hear it. Mm. I told her to go into the hearing accessibility feature and turn on um, alerts with flashes. She turned it on, a text came, the phone flashed, a voice uh, or phone call came, the text flashed, blah, blah. Move forward, she gets her phone fixed and kept that feature on because she found it so helpful. My wife learned about it, turned it on. Curb cuts are another example that we use. Yes, they're great for people in wheelchairs. They're also good for moms with strollers and professionals towing their luggage or office bags or anybody pushing a cart or a hand truck, whatever have you. So universal design. Think of all users, build it for all users, and then the benefit is available to all users. And Apple set the tone to a large degree with that, although they they were kind of dragged kicking and screaming to it, but they still made the leap and built the technology into the iPhone technology. Yep. The only thing that I wish that they would do is now take that last step of mandating that there be some attention paid to accessibility by app developers. And, 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 and it's not going to be the same for all apps. If you're, for example, looking at a, an app that shows star charts and so on, you're not going to see the charts if you're blind because we haven't really learned yet, technologically speaking, how to use artificial intelligence to describe those. But at the same time, I, as a user, know what I want to look for if I understand the technology and, and I'm studying the subject so I understand what it's all about. And so it's important for me to be able to manipulate the star chart rather than telling someone else what to do and then just ask somebody what they're seeing. And Apple hasn't made that leap yet, and no one else has really done it either. Yeah, and I'm an eternal optimist, and so I, I often think about these kinds of things and, and you know how to keep grounded in this. So earlier we talked about... Um, what technology was like when we were um, young folks in, in high school and whatnot. And who would have thought that I would be describing the iPhone just in my lifetime? So you're right. Um, those things that you're describing are not available today. And who knows what's going to be available in five or 10 years. Um, and frankly, the escalation of progress is geometrical, right? I think what it took to go in terms of the progress made from 1978 to 1998. Um, these days, we can see that same scale of progress yeah. made just in a few short years. Yeah, absolutely, we can. It, um, you know, and, and some people are going to be dragged kicking and screaming into it, which is unfortunate, but that's going to happen. I, um, as you know, work with a company uh, called Accessibi that has used artificial intelligence to make websites accessible. And we see opposition from people who, as near as I can tell, haven't totally internalized what the artificial intelligence process can bring. It's not perfect. Um, and, and there are things that we ha can't use technology necessarily to describe like bar charts and some pictures and so on. But the reality is that the technology does an incredible amount. I remember back in 1985, I started a company to sell computer-aided design systems to architects. And the opposition from architects was really fierce because they said, well, but now we can't we can't make nearly as much money because we can't bill for the same amount of time because now you can do something in three days that maybe took us a month to do. And I said, why has anything changed? It's not the time that it took you to draw it. It's the expertise. And mm -hmm. if you bring that expertise to the CAD system, um, you can still charge just as much as you ever could. And what I see with Accessibi is that the programmers don't recognize that if they used Accessibi to actually let it do what it can do, which is also evolving, by the way. And Accessibility as a company has now started its own 
process to do internal or to do coding with with people that it hires. But still, the artificial intelligence process is, has grown and will continue to grow. And why not let it do all the lifting that it can do? And then a programmer comes in and does the rest. Why do they need to charge any less? It's still their expertise. Yeah, you're hinting a little bit at sort of the a bigger shift that has taken place in society, which is the business model mm-hmm. and what gets monetized, um, and then you know how how do how do companies capitalize on the monetization of these changes underway? Um, I suspect that um, coming through COVID over the last three years. Um, we've accelerated tremendously things that were already here, but not necessarily um, in full swing. Um, but I think the other thing that that got accelerated is the shift to business models and ways of monetizing um, products and services that we hadn't thought about it in the past. I would expect we're going to see uh, an explosion of that in the coming years and, and decades. Yeah, we have um, people who are absolutely opposed to the whole concept of what Tesla's doing with not totally yet, totally self-autonomous vehicles or automated vehicles, but it's coming. Um, and again, it seems to me the people who resist it are people who are primarily not letting their imaginations and vision really go because the the fact of the matter is that we ought to take driving out of the hands of drivers anyway, the way they drive. I love to tell people, I really don't understand why the DMV won't let me have a license given the way people drive around Victorville. (laughs) So, you know, I don't see the problem here myself. Oh, it's, it's kind of funny, but you know, the, the fact is that, that the time is going to come when the technology will really allow for us to take, the basics of driving away from people, which hopefully will make the roads and uh, people a lot safer. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Um, there's evolution of, of what's available and what it can do. And then there's socialization of what's um, available and people's acceptance of it. Um, I think you see that changing very quickly. Um, you know, as more and more vehicles have the technology in them, society will become increasingly more comfortable with it. Um, and it, it will evolve. It will evolve. Probably not as fast as you or I would like, but uh, it'll get there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see them do it today, but yes. But but it will happen. And I think the very fact that you and I understand that it will happen helps. Um, yeah. And we'll find that more native stuff gets done. I, your your point earlier about native accessibility is absolutely a very relevant thing. Um, and that will happen more and more as as time goes on, not only for people with disabilities, but just so many other things will become natively available. And that's fine. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes. So how has the the concept of rehabilitation and the department kind of evolved over the years, do you think? Well, I, I mean, I think as, as you just reflect on the conversation that we've been having around technology um, and around society and society's attitudes, I think you can also parallel that with the workforce. And so for us, our continuous, continual focus is going to be on how do we help individuals get into the jobs and what does it take um, to get that job and then what does it take to keep that job and, and grow in that job. So rehabilitation is also evolving in some significant ways um, and yet not nearly as fast as we all would like for that to be the case. Um, I mentioned COVID-19 a few minutes ago. We have just made a major shift to remote work. And so I don't think that um, we are as ready as a a national program to help people, one, identify the skill sets that they need to work remotely, and two, to develop that skill set so they can be competitive and effective um, employees um, in this remote virtual world, hybrid world that we're moving into. 
So as an example, you and I are here on Zoom. And so we as blind people, we think Zoom is what you should use because it's workable, but employers are using Teams and Google Meets um, and WebEx and any number of other things. And so if we want to go work for that company, we better have the skill set that it takes to engage with that product. So rehabilitation has to catch up with what that understanding is and really start leaning into and developing um, the technical um, and the workplace skill competence to uh, effectively function um, in this world. And then the jobs are changing so quick. You talked quite a bit about artificial intelligence. Big fear is that's going to do away with jobs. Um, it's going to do away with tasks and activities and cause jobs to be restructured, cause functions um, to be rethought of in terms of how they're performed. Uh, so we have to make that um, adaptation. We have to make that change as well um, in terms of training individuals for the workforce. And again, there's a generational piece to this. Mm -hmm. That 50-year-old in a workplace is going to be less embracing of that technology by and large than, you know, that 15, 20-year-old who's showing up tomorrow. And I think that it, it won't do away with jobs. It will change how we do jobs, and which is, yeah. I think, partly what you're saying. But it, it won't do away with jobs because it still takes the creativity and the intellect that we bring to it. And I think that no matter how artificial intelligence grows, there still has to be the human aspect of it. Now, Ray Kurzweil yeah. will tell you that we're going to integrate humans and computers when, and that'll be the singularity. But the, the reality is that it's still going to be the human that drives it. And I believe that, that it's important to adapt, but the fact is, I think there's just going to be as many jobs as there ever has been. Some of the natures may change, but we should be able to live with that. Well, I don't know that we have a lot of choice um, yeah. because it's, it's here. It's moving fast. Um, these last three years accelerated the heck out of a lot of things. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, um, I, and I don't even remember who mentioned this to me, but, but somebody said, you know, with all the things that are happening with technology, what really is new? in some period of time. We haven't invented anti-gravity or other things like that that are uh, the, the, the real game changer. What we're doing is developing technology to enhance and improve how we do things, but doing something totally new and different hasn't really happened yet. And, and that will happen at some point, whether it be transporters to be not too cute, but serious for anti-gravity or um, developing uh, the ability to communicate mentally and so on. Those things will occur at some point, but they're not here yet. And who knows how long that will be. That will be a real major game changer. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not one of those people who thinks it's not here yet. I think it's not where I see it or you see it. But I think a lot of that stuff is people are thinking about these things. People yeah. are doing these things. And, um, Society and technology and everything is moving very quickly. And uh, we developed a line here in the organization as a result of change, highlighting um, a little bit of what you're talking about, which is when we move from giddy up to beam me up. Giddy up like you were doing transportation on horseback to beam me up like uh, I think you just made a Star Trek. Um, Star Trek, right. 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 So we think we, you know, <laughs> We think that's all fanciful stuff. It's really not. It's here. Um, Jules, so Jules, Michael, Verne's created, Jules Verne created the Nautilus back in the 1800s. Well, yeah, there you go. So, you know, if you think about back to M Michael, when you said you were 10 years ahead of me, so between 68 and 70, there was the uh, robot that vacuumed the carpet. Yep. And now call it a Roomba. Um, there was the device that... Uh, you know, the, on TV, they walked over, put their meal in it, and it was done in a couple of minutes. We call that the microwave, okay? And there was that device on the wall that you spoke to, and you could see somebody in it. And now we have, you know, Zoom and FaceTime and so many other things that 
that do that. And um, these things happen. You mentioned the Echo a while ago, and it's a it is a device that has made a lot of things much more convenient uh, for for Karen for well for both of us. Uh, yeah. I can tell it to turn the lights on, or I can tell it to turn the lights off. And pretty much, although it been a couple of times it tried to cheat me, but mostly if I tell it to turn off living room or master bedroom, it will turn off living room, master bedroom. A couple of times it says head okay, and it didn't really do it. But I can pretty much have faith that it's going to, or I can tell it to uh, play news or whatever. And I mean, that's not all that old, but now we're getting a generation that is so used to it they can't imagine just doing the things that we used to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is okay. Yeah. But, but let's think about this. You and I didn't do things in a way our grandparents did. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with that. Yep. But I like to be able to understand what they did because it gives me perspective. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's the important thing that I wish more people would do is learn a little bit more about history. I mean, we have a generation that doesn't really understand CDs today, as in compact discs. But <laughs> how about I had to. I you had you to. mentioned the A-track. How about the um, oh the reel-to-reel recording? And <laughs> and and I have I have some I have actually two sitting on my desk because I used to collect and I still collect old radio shows and I yeah. have a library of stuff on reel to reel tape that one of these days I'll get industrious and transcribe across, there but you're you right. Go. And, and look, we could go back further. The wire recorder, yeah. which really confounded the allies during world war II because Germany invented it. And they were, um, they didn't understand how Hitler could give two very clear speeches at the same time when what they yeah. were doing was using this wire recorder. Yeah. Yeah. And very few people I bet understand that today. Well, you oh, mentioned you go mentioned ahead. COVID. You meant I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You mentioned COVID a while ago. How how did you um, survive as as an organization? You were successful at continuing to keep the department going and so on during what was clearly a major change in the way we had to do business. Well, so. I mean, I think there's a few things that we did here at the department that, you know, in, in retrospect, really worked well for us. One was we embraced the times that we were in, um, things like remote work. We had not really moved to remote work in the way that we needed to. Um, and we leveraged remote work to make sure that people were able to continue working and we were leverage the virtual to make sure that consumers could still uh, continue to get their services, right? Um, and I think that in the long term was really beneficial to us. Um, I think another thing that we did here in the department, and this is not, um, I'm not making any kind of ideological or philosophical statements, just talking about what we did here is we really left um, to the experts, public health, what to do and and what were the appropriate actions in the workplace when it came to COVID. And so we have followed those and applied those very carefully, but we left it to them to decide what was necessary um, and appropriate. Um, And we felt a very strong um, responsibility to both life and livelihoods um, of of our 2000 staff. So I I think those things As we look back on our experience, I think we're very pivotal. Um, We leverage flexibility in so, so, so many different ways to be able to do things we hadn't thought of before. And so I think all those really um, paid out, uh, paid off over time, over the three plus years that we've been doing this. And we'll continue to grow. Yeah, exactly. You um, and I have talked a lot about employment and unemployment. The unemployment rate uh, for blind and other persons with disabilities has typically been in the 65 to 70 percent range, and it isn't changing a lot. Why do you think that is, and what can we do about that? Yeah, well, it's funny. It's funny, not funny, like, ha-ha, funny, like, in a weird sense, right? ADA was passed 
um, in 90. So, you know, do the math. What are we, 32 years in? Yeah. Tremendous progress in so many areas, except for one, unemployment, on scale. I think it's done a tremendous amount for, for um, pockets and individuals of getting to work. But I, as I thought about that over the years, there's probably a few things that I will highlight here. One is the higher manager, the fear of uncertainty of the unknown when it comes to disability um, and being more curious about how I would find the bathroom or the food on my plate rather than how I might get the job done. And I think there's certainly a society, a societal attitude for us to um, do that, right? Um, and I think in some ways, society's attitude shifting has been slower than we had hoped. Although I see great signs in the last five years where it's really amping up considerably. So I, I look at things like even here in California, ending sub-minimum wage, which um, has been a long time coming. But that to me is an example of the shift in the attitudes, right? The other thing that I think um, we all have to do better at is really start engaging youth at the earliest possible opportunity about employment. Because the expectation that they will go to work, the question is when or where, not if, means that they're going to have people around them supporting that development of that competence. They will need to be competitive um, and to be in the workplace but it also will be impactful on the rest of society um, in terms of ensuring that they are aware of what people with disabilities can do. And at the end of the day, we spend a lot of time working with businesses to understand that hiring individuals with disability is just access to the marketplace. 61 million people in the states with disabilities, you throw in friends, um, allies, uh, families, that's a pretty large block of resources, pretty large block of market um, that individuals would be leveraging. And so we just got to keep pushing the envelope on that. And, and we will, we will, but it has been stubbornly persistent um, and slow in moving. What would you say to employers who are approached by someone with a disability who wants a job or just as they think about the whole concept of hiring somebody who happens to have a disability? You know what I'm going to say to you? I said, believe in the talent and potential of people with disabilities. My yeah. five-year-old grandson does not look at me as a blind person and see any barriers whatsoever, right? And he's going to grow up and he's going to be in the workplace and somebody blind in the workplace won't matter to him at all, Right. Um, representation, as I mentioned, really matters. It provides access to the marketplace, and that is invaluable. And so we definitely need to continue to focus on that. So um, I think those two things are, are things that I say to employers every single day, right? People with disabilities have amazing talents, and they can um, bring a lot of talent to your workplace and they represent a market that you want to access because if you're in business, you're selling your product or you're selling a, a service. At the end of the day, that's what business is all about. And the reality is that people who have a disability who get hired are also probably, well, are more apt to stay because they know how hard it was and is to get a job. And if a company treats them well and recognizes that, that they're part of the company and treats them that way, they're going to want to stay there probably more than most people because they know how difficult it was in the first place to get there. Yeah, I definitely think that's, a, that's an element, no question about it, right? Um, and, and frankly, they can bring some ingenuity and some creativity to your workplace that uh, you probably haven't thought about. Um, simply, and people with disabilities, sure. we learn lots of strategic ways of getting things done. Right. And we've, we've done that because we've had to, and that yep. experience counts for a lot. Absolutely. Totally agree. Well, this has been fun and uh, we've now been doing this for a while and I really appreciate your time. Um, how do people learn more about, well, in California or in general about rehabilitation services, wherever they are, what, what kind of suggestions do you have? And do you have a way if somebody wants to talk with you or interact with you? Is there a way to do that or how does that work? 
So the the probably the easiest way for um, anyone who's out there listening, no matter where you are, go to our webpage, um, www.departmentofrehabilitation.ca.gov or dor.ca.gov, um, and you will find our webpage here in California. You'll find contact information. If you wanted to send me a note, you can do that. If you wanted to figure out where our programs and services or where our offices are throughout the state of California, you will find all that. And if you're looking for employment or if you have somebody um, around you who has a disability and is looking for employment, connect them, right? Because employment is an essential pillar of good health. Um, and we really want people to get into um, a family sustaining job so that they have um, the opportunity to provide for themselves and their families, just like everybody else and enjoy um, the same benefits and opportunities there. So. Yeah. And I would only add to that, that if you are someone who knows someone who uh, let's say is going blind or has a disability or is just, has just dis- discovered that they have a disability or who was in the auto accident that Joe mentioned earlier, don't treat them like a pariah. Don't treat them like they can't do things. Disability doesn't mean inability. And I think it's a very important thing that we need to learn. I think we need to change what the definition of disability is all about. I haven't come up with a better word for it. So um, people yeah. seem to be able to change diversity because it doesn't include disabilities anymore. So disability doesn't necessarily and shouldn't mean inability at all. Yeah, well said. So um Please remember, just because someone may lose eyesight or lose uh, some of their ability to move around or any number of other kinds of things, it doesn't mean that they are still not able to be just as productive, just in a different way. Yep, totally the case. Well, again, thank you for being here. I hope people will reach out and learn more about what the California Department of Rehabilitation does and other departments as well. And I hope that you'll all reach out to us here. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at michaelhi at accessibility.com or go to our webpage, www.michaelhingson, and Hingson is H-I-N-G-S-O-N.com slash podcast. Love to hear from you and love to hear your thoughts. And uh, Joe, once more, thank you very much for taking the time to come on. I know you spent a lot of time here and appreciate it very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Good to chat with you and look forward to seeing you uh, down the road. Absolutely.